Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Uh, this is gonna this is gonna be more of a I don't know a study than a sermon, I guess. Kind of got a different thought. Second Thessalonians in one hand and Jude. The little book of Jude, right before Revelation. Alright, Second Thessalonians, chapter 2, we're just going to start at the uh, first verse and we'll read a little bit. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. In Paul's day, they were writing letters claiming to be from Paul when they weren't. As that the day of Christ is at hand, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, talking about the day of the Lord, except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. What I want to bring your attention to is in verse 3, uh, where it talked about, for that day shall not come except there, be, there come a falling away first. Now, in the book of Jude, we went through the book of Jude, we, I forget how many times, how long we was in there, do you remember Brother Bradley? I have no clue. We was in there quite a while. Uh, we spent several, several uh, months, I think, in the book of Jude. And it deals with apostasy. It deals with falling away. Look at verse, uh, look at verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. I, even after Israel had witnessed and had been a part of all the miracles that God had done there, the, the ten plagues and the crossing of the Red Sea and delivered them from Pharaoh and from Egypt, even after they experienced that great deliverance, they still fell away. Afterward destroyed them that believe not. I got to thinking, and that's us. That's us. Many of us have been delivered from Egypt. Amen. Top of this world. We've been delivered from Pharaoh, Satan, the God of this world. We've been, we've been uh, uh, led into a promised land, so to speak. We have, we're headed there now. Amen. So it's a picture, spiritually, is a picture of us. And there's a lot of people falling away. A lot of people are falling away. And I, I want to just kind of give you a couple of thoughts on causes of falling away. If we can recognize what causes us to fall away, what causes the apostasy, what causes Christians to turn back, what causes people to just throw in the towel and give up, if we can recognize those things, Maybe we can stop them before they become part of us, before we fall victim to it. So uh, I want to deal with it just shortly, and I, I'm just going to give you about six things. First of all, what is the cause of most people falling away? We're living in a day and age, like I say, even our news media makes a big deal of how many churches are closing. Uh, it's on the news how many churches are closing today. A lot of it's due to the COVID. And, uh, uh, but, but honestly, even with COVID, that's no reason for the, for the church to close. Right. Right. It ain't the first pandemic the church had to ride through. But it's the first pandemic this generation had to face. And I'm afraid we didn't pass the test as well. Mm, that's, a, that's the difference. But first of all, the number one cause, I think, for falling away is forgetting. 
Forgetting. Forgetting. Uh, look at Jude verse uh, 5 here. Here, I've done a turn page a couple times. Jude verse 5. If forgetting causes us to fall away, causes people to fall away, then what will help you from falling? What will, what's the opposite of forgetting? Remembering. Look at verse 5. I would therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people. We need to remember what the Lord done for us. Remember how he saved us from Egypt. Remember how he saved us from Pharaoh. Remember how he did those works in our lives. We need to remember those things and that will help us from falling. Now turn to 1 Corinthians. Give your Bible study. This is more like I said, this is almost a Bible study because I'm going to give you some verses because honestly, where the power is is not in the preaching, it's not in the message, it's not in the outline as much as it's in the Word. We've got to get the Word in our heart. Amen? We need to remember the Word. Get it hid in our heart so that the Holy Spirit can bring it back when we need it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, and for time's sake, I'll not read it all, but in 1 Corinthians 11, start about verse 19, we're, we're dealing with the Lord's Supper. And there's one verse I want you to focus in on, and it's verse 25. It says, After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. One of the ordinances, one of the two ordinances that the church has uh, is the Lord's Supper, the other being baptism. But the Lord's Supper is a memorial service. It is a service that we uh, set aside and we remember what the Lord did for us. Uh, some churches do it once a year. Some churches do it every Sunday. We do it twice a year here. and We kind of stagger it. We do one in uh, spring around Easter. We do the other uh, around Thanksgiving in the fall of the year toward the, toward the winter. And, and, and it and we kind of balance it out like that so that we are reminded. It's a service where we are, where we sit down and we remember the blood that was shed, his body that was broken. We remember the cost of our salvation. That keeps us from falling. Being able to remember the price paid for us. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nursed up into the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. There in verse 6, it, it said that in order to be a good minister, you're to put people in remembrance. In remembrance. A lot of times my preaching is repetitious. A lot of times you, you hear preachers and it seems like they preach the same thing. They call it a hobby horse sometimes. Whatever the preacher feels is very important. Whatever the Lord's laid on his heart uh, that is of uh, uh, importance to him, it seems to take precedent in his ministry. And he wants you to remember this and always think about this and they preach on it a lot. And people say, well, he just rides a hobby horse. No, he's just wanting you to remember. Remember and don't forget. And in order to be a good minister, we need to bring back to remembrance what you already know. How that Jesus died, he was buried and he rose again. How that he loves you, how that how that He's called you into His service, how that He wants you to serve Him. Amen? But forgetting is one of the causes of falling away. People forget just how good God has been to them. It's hard to believe. It really and truly is. It's hard to believe that someone could forget how good God's been to them but you go and talk to somebody who ain't been in church in a while, they'll tell you all about their troubles, and they'll tell you God's been beating them up or they've had it rough. They forgot just how good God has been to them. If it wasn't for God, they'd be headed for hell. If it wasn't for God, who's to say they wouldn't be there already? 
They've forgotten. Not only that, but they're focused. They're focusing on the wrong thing. Colossians 3 and verse 2. Look at Colossians 3 and verse 2. It says, set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. Uh, a lot of times the problem is people set their focus on the wrong thing. They start focusing on problems and troubles and trials down here and they set their affections on things down here and they look over at their neighbor and their neighbor has a boat and I don't have a boat. Their neighbor has a camper and I don't have a camper. Their neighbor has a Ford and I have to drive a Chevrolet. Oh my God. <laughs> hey man, that was Brother Larry. <laughs> I'm just picking up. But you know what? They do that. And they, they, they get so focused on the things of the world, they forget this ain't our home. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The hardest job a preacher has today is getting God's people to remember this is not our home. Everybody has sunk down roots and they have just anchored in and like they're going to live here forever. We're just temporarily passing through. I'm headed for glory land one of these days. A good example of losing focus is in 1 Kings 19. In 1 Kings 19, what happens? What happens when you lose focus? Now, in, in 1 Kings 18, Elijah is up on Mount Carmel. He's calling fire down from heaven. He kills the 250 false prophets. I believe it was 450 by the time you take it all into consideration. He killed, had almost killed. He alone by himself handled that. He had called rain back down. It hadn't rained in the space of three and a half years. And he called for rain and rain came. He girded up his loins and outrun Ahab's horse and buggy all the way back. And Jezebel started running her mouth. And the next chapter you find him under a juniper tree having a pity party. I and I alone left. And he's just ready to just die. Take my life from me. He's just ready. Why? He lost his focus. He, he was no longer looking to the God that had answered his prayer. He was no longer looking to the God that just... Uh, brought rain and fire down from heaven. He wasn't looking to that. He was worried about what that woman had said. Some naysayer, some complainer, he allowed them to take his focus. And that's what's happened to a lot of people today. They forget the goodness of God and they focus on the goods of this world and they fall away. That brings us to number three, forsaking. Back to 2 Thessalonians. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Oh, where is it? In verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us. He said, don't be shaken. In verse 5, he says, remember ye not when I was with you, I told you these things. And oh, where is it? He said, stand fast here somewhere. I'm overlooking it. I just broke the chapter marker down and I, I, for the life of me, I'm not seeing it right now. But we're to stand Fast. Here's a good one. Ephesians. Let's just turn there and look at that. I, I know what happened that. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, read, what's the opposite of forsaking? Standing. Forsaking means you're quitting and turning your back. Standing means you stand up. For what's right. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. And it goes on down through there. 
We are to stand, stand, stand. And the problem is people have forsaken their stand. A lot of churches are closing their doors because people have forsaken the assembling of themselves together. They have forsaken God. They have forsaken the church. Turn to Hebrews. Let me show you something in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. I know you know the verse. Everybody knows the verse. But let me show you. Hebrews 10 verse 25. It says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. The manner of some is they're forsaking it today. That's their manner. We no longer care about those old customs of assembling ourselves together. We don't see the need in attending a church today. I could have a church just to get at home, liar. That's just the truth of it. It's, it's a lie. You cannot have a church just to get at home when you're told not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. There's strength that you can draw from other Christians. There's strength that you glean from them. There may be something you don't remember, but they do remember. For how many times have you, uh, I, I've asked Brother Bradley, Brother Bradley, you know where that verse is? Uh, I've, I've come in and I, I have a thought that would go with the message, but I can't remember where the verse is. I say, Brother Bradley, you remember where that is? Or I've asked Brother Roger, maybe even Brother Ryan, do y'all remember where that verse is? Because I want to put it in the message. I want to I want to read it again before I get in the pulpit. They may be able to remember it and help you. They may say something that would be a blessing. They may give a testimony. There may be a song. There's something here that we need or he wouldn't tell us not to forsake ourselves. Now look, let's look at the rest of the verse. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. You get encouragement here. You get uplifted. You may be down. You may be having your pity party under your juniper tree and show up and somebody encourage you. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. As you see, the, look, the closer we get to the Lord, the more we ought to draw in close to Him. The opposite of forsaking is drawing as close to the Lord as you can. People today have forsaken the book, They've forsaken the Lord, they've forsaken church, and they're wondering why they don't have any, uh, 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 why they don't have any spiritual power in getting prayers answered, and why, why they struggle so much spiritually. It's because they've forsaken. I was, I was this week, this week, two men, two men, pulled me aside, pulled me aside. I was trying to, one, one time I was trying to work, I, I was mopping, I was sweating, I, I was wanting to get stuff done so I could just go ahead and get out and pull me to the side and said, Preacher, I want you to know the Lord spoke to my heart. The message you preached tonight really, really, really got a hold of me. You, you just tired me up. I said, I wasn't tearing, I wasn't aiming at anybody. I said, I was just preaching the truth, and if the Lord dialed your number, that was the Lord, you know. Give the, you know, the Lord's the one that did it. It wasn't me. And he says, no. He said, I, I, I know I know the Lord did it. He said, but you tore me up, preacher. You tore me up. <laughs> and, and, he, and he started talking about how he had used COVID as an excuse not to come. And it was just so, so, so much easier to stay at home. It's hard to, to get up and get back to the routine. Is what he said. And he said, I want you to know, preacher, it made a difference in my life and I'm going, I'm going to be here. He wasn't here this morning. Huh. Another one pulled me to the side and was talking to me and how great it was and took up a lot of time when I needed to be working and, and everything like that and talked about how he was coming and going to bring his kid. And he wasn't here. We're in the falling away. When people See, I didn't go to them. I didn't make them profess and, and, and promise and swear to me that they were going to be. I didn't do any of that. They came to me. And they still can't even fulfill their word. That's the day in which we live. Used to be, you, a preacher could go to somebody and get them to promise they'd come, they'd be there. Mm -hmm. Now when they promise me, preacher, I promise I'll be there. I don't even look for them. 
Because that rascal did not come. He did a lie to my face. You say, preacher, that's awful. That's terrible. That's the day in which we live. And as we see this day approaching, we ought to draw as close to the Lord as we can. Get in His book more. Get in, get involved in everything that we can get involved in. Number four. After forgetting how good God is and focusing on the wrong things, you begin to forsake some things. You, you lay your Bible down. You don't pray as often. And then you'll find yourself here following the world. Following the world. Doing things you never thought you would do. When you got saved, you quit this and you quit that. You don't go here and you don't go there. But as you begin to fall away, you find yourself back in some of those old routines and in those old habits, visiting those old memories, visiting those old places, talking to those old friends, and you'll find yourself right where you used to be if you're not careful. That's falling away. That's falling away. That's following the world. Some people say, well, preacher, I just fell into sin. I couldn't help it. No, no. I, I, I looked up that phrase today, fell into sin, falling into sin, and it does not appear in the King James Bible. You know why it don't appear in the Bible? Because it's not Bible. It's not Bible. You didn't just fall into sin, just walk around one day and there's a hole there and you just fell into sin and you're stuck like quicksand and can't get out. It was a choice you made. Right. It was a choice you deliberately made. It may not have the... You may be paying consequences you didn't foresee, but the choice to get there was yours. I hope you understand that. We're not to follow this world. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos 3.3 you know why you came out of the world? Because, you're, because you no longer agreed with the world when you got saved. Yeah. If you're walking with the world again, if you're hand in hand with the world again, that means you're turning your back on God. Because God hadn't changed. Who's changed? If you're going back to the world, it's because you've turned around. Yeah. Not Him. 2 Corinthians 6.17 We're to come out from among them and be separate. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11 is good, but turn to Jude. For time's sake, I, I don't know how long it's been. I don't, I don't know how long I'm going to preach, but I, I'm trying to hurry. Jude. Jude 1, 24. Well, preacher, I just, I just, I don't know what happened. I just fell into sin. Look at verse 24. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling. How's that? And to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. He can do it easily. If you'll let Him. Just draw as close to Him as you can. Amen. After forgetting how good God is. After focusing on the world and the wrong things and what they've got and their goods and the shiny and the Oh, I'd like to have this and that. Hey, listen, I'm not impervious to it. We all go through it. We all have flesh and temptations. We have to watch ourselves. We have to control this flesh and not let it lust after things like that and desire things like that and covet things like that. It's a sin, and it will lead you to forsaking some things. You'll forsake your Bible reading. Your attendance will go down. Your prayer life will go down. You'll find yourself following the world. And then eventually, number five, you'll fold. Folding. I don't know about you, but I told you, y'all know my testimony. I was 22 before I got saved. I was lost as a bat. So I'm using a, a poker analogy in my sermon. You say, I don't think you ought to do that. Well, then when you write a sermon, don't do that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But I'm using a poker analogy. 
It's something I understand and I know some of you understand. Amen. When you play poker, you know what you do? You, you've got your cards, they've got their cards, and if you think your cards won't beat his cards, instead of betting, you just lay them down. You quit. You don't lose any more. You don't have to give up any more. You don't have to sacrifice any more if you just lay down those cards and walk away. That's called folding. You know what's bad about folding? What if the other guy's lying to you? Mm -hmm. It's called bluffing. Amen? And I was a good bluffer. Why? Because I was a good liar. You say, preacher, that's awful, that's terrible. I was! I was. They call it a poker face. What you do is you make them think you've got a tick. You say, what is that? Well, when you get a good hand, you know, some people, they can't help it. They get giddy. They get a little giddy. I got an ace. And a king. You, 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 you can see it on their face. So when I look down to a two and a four, I got an ace. I got a king. Make them think that my hand's better than it was trying to get them to fold. Amen? And you know that's what the devil does? The devil tries to get you to fold. You've got the best hand. There is no greater hand than salvation. There is no better chance of winning the pot. Amen? Getting it all. Amen? Because you have... Jesus is the ace in the hole. Amen? Amen? Some of you poker players understand that. and The rest of you, don't learn it. You'll lose your money. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, we're to hold it fast. Don't fold. Don't, don't fall in the towel too easy. Don't quit. People quit so easy nowadays. It just blows my mind how easily men are offended and ready to quit. How easily women get their feelings hurt and are ready to quit. It's just too easy. Listen, this flesh is going to want something that it shouldn't have just like your child. Your child is going to want something that it shouldn't have. It's going to come in there. You've worked all day, ladies, and you've got dinner ready, and it's broccoli and liver, and boy, you're just looking forward to feeding them that junk. And the kid comes in there and wants ice cream. What are you going to tell him? No, wait till after dinner. No, you can't have no ice cream. I've worked hard all day. I've worked slaved over this stove. I've prepared a meal, and this is what you eat. You know, sometimes that's what the Lord does. But we don't want to eat it. Mm -hmm. We want some ice cream. And when we don't get the ice cream, what do we do? We throw a tantrum sometimes just like the kids. Okay, that's it. I quit. I fold. That's it. Just throw down cards. I ain't sacrificing no more. I ain't losing no more. I ain't going through no more. No more. Because I'm done. I'm done. Look at First Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid. Keep it. Keep it. Don't throw it down. Don't, 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 don't fold. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings in opposition of science falsely so called. Don't listen to the bluffs. Don't listen to the devil. Don't listen to the complainers. Don't listen to the discouragers. Don't listen to those that would try to distract you from doing what you ought to do. Hold fast. Amen. Second Thessalonians 5. Or excuse me. 1 Thessalonians. Turn on back to 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Amen. 2 Timothy. Go back to 2 Timothy. You say, preacher, you're all over the place. Yep, does you good to turn that Bible. Yeah. yeah, I can't keep up with you. Turn faster. Amen. All right. 2 Timothy. Here, I'm in 1 Timothy because I'm running my mouth. 2 Timothy 4. Now listen to this. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be in season, out of season. 
reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. And we are there today. We're seeing this happen in the day in which we live. People will get saved and they can't stand a good, strong Bible doctrine preaching, teaching church. They will seek out the liberal church. They will seek out the churches that have lower standards. It, they can live ha ha a little bit looser and they don't get convicted over this sin or that sin. They pick their church rather than pray, Lord, where would you have me go? Where should you where is best for me and my family? They say, well, you know, we can go over there and that preacher don't preach so hard against this or that preacher don't preach so hard against that. They don't say it out loud, but that's what's going on in their heart. That's how they're making their choices. They fold. In Titus 1, verses 8 and 9, again, we're told to hold fast. Why? Because there's many... Many that will try to discourage you. Many will try to get you to quit. Many will bluff and try to get you to bet. Amen. But anyway, uh, look at the last one. I'll give you this last one. And this one is going to probably surprise you. Fornication. Fornication. Another cause of falling away is fornication. Turn to Revelations chapter 2. Now when I say fornication, I'm talking spiritually and physically. It could be both. Revelations chapter 2, look at verse 18. In Revelations 2, 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, Who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and feet are like fine brass. I know thy works in charity and service and faith and thy patience, and thy works and, thy and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things, sacrifice the idols. Now, that's not just talking about physical fornication. That's spiritual fornication as well. You, you go worshiping other things. Uh, let's look at another verse. 1 Corinthians 5. In 1 Corinthians 5, you know what was going on? In 1 Corinthians 5, we're going to get there for long. There's fornication going on in the church. 5.1, it is reported commonly that there's fornication among you. And such fornication as not so much named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. A man's son is sleeping with his wife, which would have been his stepmom. In the church, here in the chapter, look at the very last verse. But them that are without, God judges, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person, that wicked person, fornication, going after the pleasures of this world, going after the strange gods of this world, and worshiping the things of this world uh, will cause problems. In 1 Timothy 4, 1, you've seen it uh, again, I believe we've already read that, but let's look at it again. In 1 Timothy 4, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, in latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits, seducing spirits, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, what is that talking about? That's talking about spiritual fornication. Following false doctrine. Following the wrong doctrine. You see it again in Revelations 2, 14 and 15, where it talked about the doctrine of Balaam. You know what the doctrine of Balaam was? The doctrine of Balaam was teach Israel how to fornicate with people they're not supposed to and that would get them to worship idols and gods of those women and that was both physical fornication and spiritual fornication. God divorced Israel. You know why? 
because she went a whoring after other gods, fornicating with other gods. That's spiritual fornication. Now, when, you know, a, a lot of times a, a dirty mind and a dirty heart, people get convicted. And when they get convicted, they show up in church and they get convicted. Even if the preacher don't mention their sin, they're convicted because they know that they're not right or something's said or someone looks at them and they think they know and then they begin to worry. And if you're not careful when you're not living right and you're doing things that you ought not be doing, conviction will cause you to fall. Rather than repenting, you decide to keep doing what you're doing. Now, when I'm talking about fornicating, I'm talking about any kind of sexual act. If you're married, it's called adultery. Yeah. It's called adultery if a married person steps outside the marriage bond and any, any, any sexual activity is adultery. Any activity uh, between singles or involving a single is fornication. Now, I'll give you this. Dirty thoughts. Fornication. Mm -hmm. You say, what do you mean? Jesus said, if you look upon a woman and lust after her in her heart, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Mm -hmm. you, so, if, you, if, if, if dirty images or dirty thoughts are just looking upon a woman, boy, I tell you what, that would shut down the internet and that would get rid of half the phone usage. Yeah. You're right. You're right. You say, what? I challenged I challenged the parents uh, several years ago, and I had some kids mad at me. I challenged the parents to take the kids' phone and look up what they've been looking at. That phone, you, you say, well, well my, my kids, they, 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 they've got parental guard on it, and you don't think they can get around it. You, you, don't, you, you, don't think, you don't think they would try. You don't think one of their buddies at school don't, hadn't already figured out how to get around that. That is the most wicked, filthy thing that's ever been put in a child's hand. Yep. Yep. Is a smartphone. Yep. And you say, preacher, I saw. listen, I understand there's cases where a kid may need one. I, in this day and age, and with all the stuff going on in schools today, I'd want my kid to have one that was in public school too. I understand that. I understand that. I'm not preaching against... A phone. But I wouldn't let mine have one until they're 16. Right. We homeschool. Mine, want, mine came to me and wanted a phone. And Daddy, can, can I have a phone? What well, do you need a phone for? So I call somebody right there. Just phone call them on that one. Yeah. Well, now everybody else has got one. Well, you ain't everybody else. Yeah. All right. That's right. I don't have everybody else's salary. <laughs> Amen. I can't afford another one. So if you want one, you use mine. You use mama's. You use you, you can use that. They didn't need one until they started driving at my house. In my house. In my house they did. But listen, if you are paying for that phone and you're paying for the service of that phone, you have a right to take that phone and go through it anytime you want to. Yeah. And mom and dad, I'd do it. I'd do it. See what they're looking at. Oh my, I can see panic in kids' faces now. They're thinking, how do I clear that? How do I clear that? How do I delete this? Oh my. <laughs> if your kid has a phone in his hand right now, smack him. Because <laughs> that's what he's doing. Amen. <clears throat> how many of you heard this? Talk about uh, looking and lusting. And how many of you ever heard this? Well, it's okay to read the menu. Right, so somebody's heard. It. It's okay to read the menu as long as you don't eat dinner there or whatever. You know, it's okay to read the menu. No, it's not. No, it's not because you know what? Reading the menu makes you hungry for what you're reading. It's not right. You're not supposed to look upon a woman. What did Jesus say? If you look upon a woman and lust after her in her heart, you commit adultery with her. That goes the same way, ladies. If you look at a man and lust after him in your heart, you commit adultery with him. Ladies, if you dress in a way that provokes that man to lust after you, you have caused him to commit sin. Amen. Right. Yep. Oh, my. Notice what Jesus said, committed adultery with her. 
Now I know there's perverts. You can dress a woman in a tater sack, and there's some pervert going to lust after it. I understand that. We're in a wicked time, amen? But most time, if you dress modest ladies, you won't have no problem with men lusting after you. Amen, that's the truth. Amen, that goes for you too. You, you need to dress right so these queers won't lust after you. <laughs> Amen, you thought he was whistling at your wife. He was whistling at you. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why, for, wherefore then should I look upon a maid? Purpose in your heart. If that's your problem, purpose in your heart. Get that verse, get it memorized, uh, and, 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 and start working on it so that you don't become part of the great falling away. Just because we live in a day and age that is described as falling away, apostasy, which is a falling away, falling away from a stand that you once took, you once stood for something decent, you once stood for morals, you once stood for these standards, but now you've Falling from that stance, that is part of the falling away. That's part of the apostasy of this day. How do I fight it? Remember. Draw as close to him as you can. Stay in fellowship with his people. Get as far from the world as you can get. Amen. And do right. Amen. Forgetting the goodness of God. Focusing on the wrong thing. Forsaking your duties and your responsibilities to read and pray and just attend will lead you to following the world and folding. And before you know it, you're fornicating. And you're part of the great falling away. I'm asking you to bow your head and close your eyes. Well, heads is bowed and eyes